Welcome to Alienating the Audience, an audio fix for the above-average sci-fi fan. I'm Andrew Heaton, the thinking man's nerd. Today, we're going to do a thought experiment. What's the best strategy for ensuring survival on a ship that will travel thousands of years to its destination? What kind of colonists do you start out with on a multi-generational journey? How many people do you put on the ship? How do you ensure everyone wants to keep going and not turn around and cruise back to Earth when they get tired of living on a floating tin can? And after the interview, comedian Nick Sperduti and I review our recent trip to Westworld. Get your robot and a tub of protein bars because you and I are going to save humanity. My guest today, Mr. Rob Rafferty, who is a man's man, ladies' man, man about town in the nation's capital, and recently did a one-man show at the Capitol Fringe, which got five-star reviews, and uh, also uh, kind of got me, you, you were one of the big launch pads for me early on in my career, Rob. CapSouthTheSeries.com, if anyone wants to see yeah. Andrew's early work. Yeah, that was, it's, it's, it's a little raw, it's, it's a little yeah. raw, it has its moments. I, I'm funny, I'm way ganglier, I'm way ganglier <laughs> than I am right now. Can I say starring role? Was starring I, was I, role. I was, was star- you were the lead. I, I, was, I was the lead comedic actor in a in a sitcom online about Congress. And, sort of like uh, Veep before Veep. Yeah, right? that's what, you know. They probably stole that idea from us. <laughs> I think that by was, the time we actually got uploaded to YouTube, Veep was in season two or three. So people told me, "Oh, this is like Veep." Rob. Well, then, in, like, no, in, in that case, idea. they stole it from in the loop. Either there way, go. they stole <laughs> it's the same it. Which for, is the point the of this Veep. podcast <laughs> is to make fun of Veep. <laughs> Rob, you reached out to me a couple of weeks ago to congratulate me on the podcast. Podcast and to invite yourself on it because you wanted to talk to me about this really cool thought experiment. And I, I kind of started going down a rabbit hole on it. But basically, you you emailed me and went, I would love to talk to you about if we had to send a spaceship, like a multi-generational spaceship across the galaxy, how many people would you want on the spaceship? How many, how many, uh, what professions would you want on it? Right. What's what's the social balance to it? And uh, I I really have been thinking hard about this. Have you been thinking as well about what kind of how you would staff this if we, if we were uh, if we were tasked with such a journey? This has been on my mind for for several years. Uh, and as sort of someone who produces and writes and creates uh, different types of content, I'm really compelled to come up with some way to tell this story. But I start going down rabbit holes and I can't really understand what the story would be. It's like there's so many questions I have about the origins of the team that, that embarks on this journey. Yeah. Where would the story begin itself if you're you know, communicating it to an audience? What generation would it begin? What type of mythology would build up around the the, the first movers, the, the founders of this spaceship mm-hmm. journey? Like, there's so many questions, uh, Andrew. I'm glad you were interested in it. I think – you know, it's not an original idea. First of all, it's not like uh, I'm, I'm coming up with some novel content that's going to blow minds. It's uh, it's been the subject of other creative sci-fi. Uh, yeah, there's a few we, we can get into it for a minute too. Or, or, but, but would love to. Yeah. Although I don't know many of them. I, 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 unlike a lot of your listeners, I'm probably not as deep in sci-fi. I mean, I'm Star Trek, Star Wars, Aliens, Terminator, RoboCop. I'm a little more like I guess uh, you're, you're more cinematic, pedestrian, yeah, cinematic. That's, okay. That's, you know what? I do like Twilight. I was sucked into that Twilight Zone episode, and I really appreciate that. And I think this is – so far, your podcast has been fantastic. Oh, thanks, and, man. Until this episode, it has been fantastic. Yeah, that's right. This is this is where we're going to wrap up the series. Okay. Uh, this is this is going to just tie it in a bow and close okay. the whole thing down. Um, well, actually, it's, it's funny that you bring up the Twilight Zone because there is a relevant Twilight Zone episode to our topic today of if we were going to make a – multi-generational spaceship how would we function it uh and there's an episode of the twilight zone i think it's season three it's it's in this it's in the aberrant season where they had like hour-long um episodes and it's called next thursday we next thursday we go to earth or next thursday we're going home but basically you know have you seen shawshank redemption yes you you know the old guy that hangs himself at the end with the eyebrows that are visible from space that guy he's the lead in it wow and uh it's it's a really well written episode. It's a really good one, and the, the premise is that um, uh, there's there's a settlement of maybe like forty people living on some godforsaken barren rock, uh, a vast distance from from the the Earth. And okay. right there's like 
three people there who are now older, who are the only people with even a shadow memory of Earth. They they left when they were kids. Okay. Everybody from everybody from the founding generation of this colony is now dead, except for them. They, like these three old people that were, you know, now they're let's let's say, you know, they're they're in their they're they're, they're adult to grandfather. Oh, they're level. getting their social security checks. Yes, That's the they're, question. they're social security level people. <laughs> okay. um, but they they remember Earth as like toddlers, right? right? But they no one there is like an Earth person. But they have stories and things, and this. Place is so harsh that they, um, you know, they, it's a mining colony or something. Or something yeah, harsh I think, labor. I think it's, type I think it's agricultural, but it's kind of like I, I've mentioned this before. I don't like sweating. This place sounds like I would never have got on the ship. <laughs> I ne- uh, but they, they've got like two sons, and they have to like shade the crop from one of the sons because if they have both, it, so it's just it's a very and there's like uh, sandstorms that come out of nowhere and they'll have to hide in caves for a long time. It's just a very brutal pioneer thing to the point that they decide they don't want to be there anymore and they end up going home. And the episode, that episode's less to do with the composition of a group of colonists and more to do with the, the role of this leader holding it together who can't relinquish power. Okay. Um, but it, but it's still, I think it, it kind of factors into the topic we're doing. The, the other two that I think would be salient that have been covered in science fiction before is uh, Children of Time by Adrian Tchaikovsky. So Children of Time very much um, on par with with our conversation. The premise is that some massive disaster, I think it's warfare, I believe, has basically wiped out human civilization. There's one gasp left where they're going to send a colony ship Way across the stars to a, you know, a clement planet that's green and they can reasonably infer has, you know, fields of clover, whatever they can, they can colonize it, but they're going to, it's going to take like 5,000 years to get from earth to there. Um, and by the time they get there, uh, you know, they're, they're going to have had multiple generations across the ship and they deal with this across the book is, um, like at one point, there's a generation that rises up and is like, I don't want to go to this planet. Why don't yeah. we go back to Earth? You're born into this yeah. expectation that what are you here to do? Procreate, perform the duties to keep the spaceship running. Yeah. And then I got to be a space engineer. Yeah, you're not, not going to see the engineer. final destination. Yeah. Right? That's got to be a depressing realization when that comes about. I would actually kind of wonder if a society would would um, kind of mislead and lie to people in a sense. Like, We're almost there. Yeah, <laughs> it's right around the corner. Okay, well, see that that's the <laughs> other that's the third one that I think is really okay. fascinating. There's a book called Wool, um, which is a great book. Uh, Wool is I I love apocalyptic fiction. Like I love. Um, you know, kind of Cormac McCarthy type, like, you know, the grid is down, yeah. you know, Mad Max type stuff. And Wool by Hugh Howey came out uh, maybe six, seven years ago, I think. And uh, I won't spoil Wool. It, it is now a trilogy. I believe it's the Dust trilogy. But basically the setup for it, without me spoiling anything, is that um, there is a society living in what appears to be a very large nuclear uh, bunker, like a like a 3,000 people. Underground? Yeah. Okay. 3,000 people living in this bunker. Uh, and um, at the top level, you can look out the you, – you can look out these LCD screens to the world outside. Um, and the LCD screens are showing you this bleak, radioactive landscape. There's some ruins in the background, you know, some some blown apart city. But, but is it all just a show? Is it all a production? We that's kind of the thing, okay. right? We don't know. Well, I haven't seen it. By the way, I should say, I just, you know, haven't read the book. I'm yeah. aware of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't read any of these things. I haven't consumed any of this amazing uh, sci-fi content that you've well, that, that's okay, brought what, to my attention. What, I'm going what, to. What you and I are doing, Rob, is we're saving mankind <laughs> okay. because Elon Musk almost certainly listens to this program and he's going to, he, I'm just inferring that, but he's going to listen to this and go, ah, uh, uh, this is what we have to do to make this thing work if we uh, if we colonize Alpha Centauri, which is ultimately what we're doing, right? Yeah, absolutely. But in the in the Wool series, um, yeah, yeah, you're right. In the is this made up thing? It, it comes into it very quickly. So one of the things that I think is fascinating about the Wool series early on is you've got three thousand people living in this this silo. It's sustainable, right? They've got like um, they've got levels that are just dedicated to farming. They've got um, like goats or something. They've got, you know, they've got agriculture going on. They're not living off of provisions. It it is a self-sustaining unit. It's a sealed, self-containing unit. And they mention in the first chapter that at some point there was an uprising that happened that destroyed all the computer records. So the people living in this nuclear silo don't know how long they've been there. 
they know that they're not the first generation, but they they could have been they could be generation five, they could be generation thirty. They don't know if they've been there a thousand years. They don't know if they've been there a hundred years. Who, through whose eyes do you encounter the story? Is it a first person story? Is it just multiple perspectives? It's uh, it's third person, but it bounces from okay. perspective uh, perspective to perspective. And, right. and in, in the first chapter, again, without spoiling anything, the the is it real or is it fake thing? The there's this weird societal conceit there of. Um, the, the the people running this thing that are running the silo that everybody lives in have to keep you there because it's a radioactive land outside, right? They don't want people leaving um, and they want to maintain control. Right. So um, the kind of the religious sin that you can commit in the society is you can say, I want to go outside. And if you say, I want to go outside, you have to go outside. And they take you to the top level and they put you in, in a radiation suit and they kick you out. And there's a societal obligation to you. You're, you're now, you're going to die. You're going to die. But there's a societal obligation to you to go outside and to wipe the sensors clean so that everybody can keep this unobstructed view of the radio, radioactive wasteland in case someday it greens up, they'll be able to see it. This is terrifying. Yeah. I don't think I can handle that. Well, and that's it's like, like nightmares. The first, the, like the, the thing begins with the, the old sheriff of the silo. Um, going, I want to go outside. And he walks outside and it's all green. And he's like, oh my God, this whole thing is been facade, made to keep facade. us in. And then he dies. So it's like, well, at that point, was were, were they tricking him into – he thinks this is all green. Oh, it's just that the sensors have been faulty. I need to wipe these clean so that everybody no knows it's No one would intentionally green. mislead this yeah. whole population and into it, subjugation. And, right? yeah. and in that one, right. that book is very much along those lines. There's definitely like – there's definitely a – the, the people in power are intentionally fabricating falsehoods in order to keep people in line for what they perceive to be the greater good. But they are, that never happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> it's, that's why it's science fiction, Rob, because we all know that our, our leaders are always looking out for Altruism. our best interest. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, all it's elected officials. Yeah. Um, this is fascinating. Let's, if you don't mind, I love this idea of children of time and, and what you meant, what you said about the sort of origin of that story, which is interesting. So when I think about this concept, how, does a story begin? That's a really important question. I don't have an answer to this, but in your uh, in your articulation of Children of Time, you say this is an apocalyptic. It's a terrible planet. We're leaving to go to a, a much better place. Yeah, right? and I left out a bunch of stuff too. There's, okay, well, there's super fine. intelligent spiders. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, there's there's a there's a robot that goes haywire. But yeah, what, what is what you're suggesting though? I think is. And it's an important – I think it really actually is, has an incredible impact on the way that story unfolds, even though I've not read this story. I'm just imagining the people who are in the ship or have left Earth did so not voluntarily, but under duress. Yeah. And sort of like yes. – maybe they even won a lottery ticket. They're happy to be on there. I don't know. But there's like – to me, it's an interesting question because I think you could actually flip that uh, not notion on its head and you could you know create a universe in which – there are sort of uh, pioneers right. or explorers that are really excited and they're sort of volunteering and signing up to be the uh, first movers yeah. in this intergalactic uh, mission for the good for the for the good of humanity right so and fr frankly so many generations into this journey i think you could uh, the leaders of the ship could you know play you know, could, could, could manipulate that story in a way right. that is more beneficial. Or maybe it wasn't duress, you know, or do you want to tell the, everyone on the ship, look, we had to get out of there. There's no going back. Right. Earth is trash. You could lie. You could mislead. Which if I'm captain, probably we're going to say that. Because right? <laughs> well, I'm thinking like, because you, you're right, there, there could be these various scenarios, right? So like there's the duress scenario. Yeah. Um, and I think was there was Earth 2. I feel like Earth 2 was a TV show That's, back when oh. I was a kid that kind of had a comparable premise where like Earth had been ruined and like if, and basically everybody's living on space stations and there's this weird disease that's starting to affect kids. So they have to find some other place. Okay. Um, and they go they, – they, so they find Earth 2 and, you know – Like uh, what's the motive to leave this wonderful right. planet? But, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, that, that's what – I think that that would affect things because let's say um, that like you and I are just Quakers. Right. And we're like, you know what? We're going to go found a Quaker planet. Yeah. Nuts to this. We're we're sick of Las Vegas. I don't even want to be on the same planet as Las Vegas or whatever, right? Um, two or three generations in, what if our you know Quaker grandchildren are like, I don't want to live on a spaceship. Right. Cleveland sounds great. Let's go back to Earth, which is very different than if Earth is a radioactive pile of rubble right. with super intelligent rat, rat mutants or something. Or even that your, 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 your grandparents or great-grandparents who are no longer with us were chosen for this journey. 
and it's an honor, right? We're carrying on their legacy. It's not so your preference to being here or not is sort of secondary to this reality, which is you are part of the sort of chosen class of humans that are going to propagate and carry on yeah. the species. Like that makes you feel a little more important, and that could be you know a psychological tool that leaders you know employ to to motivate people to behave ways that they otherwise might not. So anyway, it, it is to me it's a, it's a fundamental question. I don't have an answer for the, the sort of story I'm hoping to tell someday, but I think it's a question I have to answer and I have to think very carefully is earth, uh, you know, burning and, and falling apart and, and people are just getting out as quickly as possible. Another, another quick, uh, sort of aside, is there just one ship? Right. Maybe it's like, Hey, okay. Even if we uh, want to go, it's not the case that we'd be constrained to have just one expedition. It's like, Hey, there are multiple planets. Here's, oh, let me back up two seconds, Andrew, just for, just to ground us because most of this is science fiction and it's all just fantasy. But my understanding is, based on extensive Google research yeah. on the internet, um, University of Google, yeah. which we're both <laughs> graduates, um, we have that is scientists of some of some note have uh, identified. I think you said Alpha Centauri, yeah. but there are actually other planets yeah, as well. There's a ton of exoplanets. They, we yeah. believe we have some reason. These scientists are saying they are they have Earth-like conditions, right. and there's a potential. Or a high probability. I don't know how they figured this stuff out, frankly, but let's just go with it. We have identified Earth-like or sort of planets that we could, that could accommodate human life. That's a fact, as far as I know. <laughs> We're going to stipulate that, right? Well, we, we, we do know that there are we exoplanets. We know, I believe we, we, we know that there are, based on all scientific evidence, right. we know that there's a whole, like, when you and I were kids, Rob, there was like one exoplanet, maybe. Like, well, we like thought Pluto maybe, was a planet still. Right. It's true. We, we had... We, <laughs> We had more regular planets. Back to planet we had regular more that. planets. Yeah, because well, now they've got an electoral vote. Uh, so and, and they got a bishop, and that's the rule: is that to be a planet, you have to have a baseball team, a bishop, and a, an electoral vote. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a ton of exoplanets, uh, and I think that they've got to the point now where they can do like a spectral analysis yes. of the extra exoplanets and go, okay, the, the the reflection of light appears to indicate that there's a high high amount of oxygen or yeah. something like that. And, that. and at that point, I don't know, you know, but we could if we're, if we're pointing, we we could point the spaceship at the most promising thing yes. to go to or there might be a, a few of them out there right and like we're going to send up five or ten ships and we're going to see it's like we're just going to take we're going to roll the dice here because yeah. not all of them are going to pan out which and at that point um if if any of them do there will be a hard evolutionary fork for two reasons <laughs> um there's going to be obviously there's going to be um some kind of genetic drift that's going to happen um assuming that the, the even if the planets are identical there is going to be genetic drift which occurs over time. Oh, yeah. um, so there's going to be random mutations that happen. But beyond that, have you read um, Have you read Starship Troopers by Robert oh, Heinlein? I saw the movie. I don't yeah, read. Yeah. I don't read, right. Andrew. Come on. So uh, there's, there's a great one-liner in Starship Troopers by Robert Heinlein that I've never seen anybody else expound in science fiction. But it's it's a really prescient thing where he the, – the main character who's a space marine, he's going out to fight bugs, right? Yep, yep. He's on some planet that is like a human outpost. And uh, one of the guys is like, I think I'm going to stay here and – I'm going to, I'm going to like, I'm retiring. I'm going to live here and, and have kids. And somebody else brings up, he's like, you don't want to do that because the planet here is so shielded from radiation that there won't be, um, the rate of mutation in the humans that live here will be so precipitously smaller compared to humans on earth that earth people are going to keep evolving and you won't. And so evolving in a, in a beneficial way or we I, don't know. I don't know. But, but what we could say though, is that wh whatever, if, if there is a variance in radiation shielding yeah. between wh wherever you are and wherever the other humans are, yeah. eventually that's going to manifest in an evolutionary fork because sure. there's going to be more mutation, just random mutation happening by virtue of cellular degradation and, and DNA degradation with radiation than if not. So if we're all living in caves, for example, um, there's not going to be as much random mutation okay. as if we're in an unshielded spaceship. I'm buying everything you're saying here. I'm going to agree with it because I nice. have no basis to disagree. Excellent. Um, I, and that, but it does lend itself to another sort of point. Uh, when we talk about genetic mutations and whatnot. Of course, you have the radio external effects. But and that hadn't had, that hadn't been something prior to this conversation that I even contemplated. So thanks for again like contributing this to this to the to the story. Um, what I was thinking is, uh, and I actually think there are some scientists who've studied this, and I haven't read their research, but I've you know read summaries of it <laughs> and tried to understand. And there's disagreement, not surprisingly, is because scientists disagree on these ideas of okay, if you were to launch a population of individuals toward that's. Uh, 
second earth type. Yeah, Alpha Centauri. Alpha yeah. go with that. Um, what, how many people would you need on that ship right. to have sufficient genetic uh, diversity? Yeah. And then you'd have to, of course, track the mating habits and such so that we don't have inbreeding and that sort of right. thing. Right. But I think the numbers have ranged anywhere from like tribes, a small number of people. If you were very diligent in regulating their uh, uh, procreation and such, that you could get away with it. But other people are like, no, no, we need to have like ten, at least 10,000 people to have sufficient diversity. So, for for multi generations, I don't I don't know the answer. Well, I actually I I can I can you yield some of this. Oh, I, I've right. done uh, I I study mating all the time, both <laughs> officially as a foyer and through formal reading. And uh, um, the the rule that I have found, uh, granted, this is a I'm basically using an agricultural rule here and applying it to human beings, but it's called the fifty five hundred rule. And the fifty five hundred rule is what you need for a viable breeding population. So. Um, this is I'll, – I'll preface this. This is a an unregulated viable breeding population, which is to say if we were looking to if, – if we opened up a new national park and we wanted to put in turkeys, we would need to have uh, uh, at least 500 turkeys for a good breeding population. It, it would be different if we were explicitly – regulating the turkeys in, 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 to attempt to make a beneficial thing. We're weeding out the ones that we know have bad genomes, things like that. Gotcha. Um, Human beings are obviously far more complicated than this because we generally like to have input yes. uh, in who we're mating with. Uh, and uh, But the, the 5500 rule, it, it's predicated on two things. Um, there's – and I'll, I'll start with the, 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 the smaller – what I view as the smaller thing and then go down because I think we're most concerned with inbreeding, right? Right. Um, as a side note, uh, there is a thing called outbreeding. Are you familiar with this? I have never heard that term. But I like it. Outbreeding is a thing that – we don't really have to worry about as a species, but but if you're a gazelle, you might want to worry about as a species. So, oh, you breed with some other uh, deer-like thing. I don't kind, know. Well, kind of. So, like, like so in in breeding, which we'll talk about in a minute. You know, the fear is that you're going to um, you're going to emphasize or duplicate negative genes to yeah. the point where you don't become viable from an evolutionary perspective, right? right? Outbreeding, you're not going to have any risk of that. Outbreeding is where you're you're um, mating with and producing offspring, viable offspring, with a genome so different from yours that there is um, very little genetic overlap. Um, and with with human beings, we have um, our genome is actually very narrow, right? We're 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 all very very similar to one another um, in terms of actual genetic diversity compared to various other species. But where where this becomes a, of issue from an evolutionary standpoint is it might be bad to have a midpoint trait. So, for example, there's a species of gazelle that lives in uh, Afghanistan, Kyrgyzstan, <laughs> fill in the blankistan, somewhere in Asia, right? Okay. And this this species of gazelle cross-mated with uh, like a plain species of gazelle or wow. uh, mountain goats and plain species. Anyway, right? So, horned animals with hooves is what I'm getting at. They mate. They can do it. They can produce viable offspring. And the offspring died out because even though these would be um, – less prone to disease, which tends to happen when you don't have inbreeding, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, the reason that they had a difficult time was that the animals that lived in the mountains typically were biologically suited to uh, produce offspring, let's say, in, in the fall, whereas the ones that lived on the plains were tip were were suited and, and biologically compelled to produce offspring in the summer. When they made it, it did a midpoint to like, now they all have babies in the winter, and that doesn't help anybody. Wow. And so by by having these two very different points and coming in the middle, it, it ends up being I, – I guess for human beings, it would be like – I can't – we could think of some bizarre science fiction scenario sure. where you either need to be a giant or a little person. And like you either – like in order to reproduce long term, you either have to be seven feet tall or you have to be three feet tall. Right. And everybody in the middle dies, right? And in that situation, you you – Outbreeding becomes problem. Anyway, that's a side note. I love it, and it's fascinating. And I need to I need to send me a link to that story. Yeah, yeah. And I'll, I'll see how we. Th th this is probably an episode that I should actually have show notes for with a bunch of links. To <laughs> hey, uh, this fifty five hundred rule. I was wondering, is that like a is it even Stephen twenty seven fifty men twenty seven fifty women? Is that when your starting population is? Is that what we're thinking? Uh, I think the the so. The gender ratio is definitely something you want to think about. I'll, I'll uh, to yeah to get back to the fifty five hundred rule. Thank you for bringing me back to that. Five hundred is is for genetic drift, which I I, I as starship captain am less concerned about. Uh, but basically, uh, genetic drift is the idea that you are going to have um, in in the same way that evolution right is uh, or natural select selection is is a force working on a viable breeding species to. Um, 
knock out bad traits, right? Genetic drift is just randomosity. So genetic drift is just if I, if we had a jar of marbles and um, uh, let's say there's I don't know there's there's red and orange marbles in it and we sh- there's fifty of each. We shake it up. And then we take the the first marble, we drop it into a a, a jar, and we put in two marbles for that. But basically, just we're, we're we're randomly creating a new jar of marbles. Sure, it's not going to be a fifty fifty right. ratio, right? right? And the more you do that over time, regardless of whether it's beneficial or not, there's just going to be random traits which um, become predominant. So if you have less than five hundred people in your your uh, your breeding population, what can happen is there could be positive traits which just die out just because statistically nobody lived to reproduce that, even though there was no evolutionary pressure. So in order to maintain positive traits um, and not risk them being weeded out of the population through randomosity, you need 500. You need 50 to avoid inbreeding, which I think is the bigger concern on a colony ship. Okay. That's my thought. I appreciate that thought, and I appreciate the the, the, the several thoughts we've had here on this, this question of g- genetic diversity, sufficient genetic diversity to sustain for multiple generations. However, it's not a core question that I think is going to – it's not a stumbling block for me in, in telling the story because – I think there are technologies that would enable us to have super diversity of this population. You could have, for instance, like frozen sperm and True, embryo, yeah. that sort of thing. And actually, this gets back to the origin story of what propelled this group to go in the first place. If you want to tell a story that is sort of like um, – Related to the struggles of uh, men and women and Earth, you could have like a is is this is this uh, ship populated only or probably predominantly by one uh, sex? Yeah, and then like. It could just be a bunch of women taken off in the ship and they have all the frozen sperm. Right. And then like, uh, what are the future of males in that society? I did a deep this- dive on this as well. <laughs> Can I tell you this, Rob? Because yes, I actually, I, my, okay. I'm, I'm thinking, tracking. I I'm, like th- I'm thinking the exact same thing. Right. right. So um, to, just to, to, to go back, 5,500 rule, 50, again, minimum population you need to avoid inbreeding. In, right. Inbreeding, we can talk about that in a minute. Right. Um, uh, but inbreeding bad, right? So you need, you need at least 50. Otherwise, you're, you're going to start duplicating traits. We, we turn into either the Habsburgs or we turn into – Pick, pick random redneck group you don't like, right? Um, the sperm thing. I, I actually did research on this because I was like, let's, let's say that like, um, we were using technology we currently have to try and get to Alpha Centauri. And so, and, and we'll put a pin in the economics of this. We're capable of, you know, building a, a $15 trillion spaceship right. that was, is going to go using, you know, existing rocket fuel and that kind of thing. We, we, we're not worried about resources here, but we, we were only using existing rocket technology, et cetera, et cetera. Sperm, when frozen, good for about 20 years. Ooh. Yeah. Um, eggs, when frozen, good for about four years. Really? Yeah. I don't know. That's well, fascinating to me. It, it is, except here's the thing. Um, we're not conducting experiments on that because the only pe- the only humans freezing their eggs are women that want to have their eggs later used. Yeah. So, no, no one, to my knowledge, is going, I'm just going to have eggs sit in the bank for like 80 years just right. to see what happens. Right. Right. No, no one's conducting You're these right. experiments. Okay. Um, I thought embryos have been frozen though for a while. Yes. That's what's cool to me. Yes. People are born like 30 years after yeah, yeah, they're yeah. conceived or something. Right. All right well, you, so tell, so, me, tell me more. Yeah, you do so, all the so, research. No, 100%. You're, you're, right. you're dead right on this. Right. right. So basically, it seems, to, it seems to, to, by my lights, if you, if you're worried about having a sufficient genetic diversity, which we should be, yeah. um, you could have like, let's say 50 people in the population, the minimal viable breeding thing, but we're going to have a backup. Right. Uh, we're going to include, we have a sperm bank and a, we have a, an egg bank on hand. Um, still potentially useful because, um, assuming that the people there have our technological level when they arrive, even if those aren't viable sperm or viable eggs, there are going to be genetic treasure, treasure troves to where they could, clone somebody based on that, right? So um, if you're going to clone someone, great way to do it is body fluids, yeah? But embryos um, appear to be basically, we don't know of the outer shelf life on embryos. The The oldest the oldest embryo, fertilized embryo of a human being was 24 years frozen before it was thawed out and popped in a lady, which is the exact medical term. I love <laughs> That's that. That's how a doctor would say it, thawed out and popped in a lady. I want to talk to that person. Right. That is fascinating. Which I got to say is interesting from like a theological perspective. Yeah, if, if you believe that souls exist and they happen at the moment of conception, that like six-year-old kid's 30 <laughs> in terms of soul years. That kid's been around. I love it. That kid was just waiting. Um, but yeah, so so we, the, the, it, we keep, I think, for a while – 13 was the oldest embryo that had been thought out and uh, and implanted as of the as, as of this recording 24 is the oldest we don't actually know what the outer shelf life is uh, because no one's gone beyond that but it's possible and and again part of the part of the problem really is just that uh, there's no demand because if if somebody is looking to adopt a kid or something 
they'll just adopt a kid. Right. Uh, in the, in these cases, it's oftentimes um, somebody uh, like there's been a few scenarios where someone maybe had a they had their husband's sperm frozen or something, and then their husband died, and they wanted to have a kid with them, that kind of thing. So there's not a lot of people that are actively seeking out embryos from other couples. Uh, we don't know how long they would last. They have done experiments to try and determine how long mice embryos would last, and they came up with 2,000 years. Wow. Um, and they, the, the way they – interesting how they did it, by the way. They Basically, they went, okay, if you've got um, – if you've got – a consistent source of energy to keep, you know, the liquid nitrogen or whatever the coolant system is sufficiently cooled with the mice embryos. They, they took those and then they, um, they basically ran them through the regular background radiation that those eggs would be absorbing over 2000 years, which is something to consider. Yeah. And like normally the gestation period for a human being is nine months. Right. Um, but if you're doing this by a thousand years, maybe the kid comes out with like five heads or something. <laughs> um, with mice, they found out 2000 years is what, from what they can tell based on, on extrapolating the data from the radiation, they pelted at this thing where they, I think, I, I guess you just take a mice embryo and you pop it in the microwave and, and you put it, you figure it out, but they, they, they calculated the, the total amount of radiation that the, the egg would sustain over a two thousand year period still viable so it's possible that if we were going to send a spaceship to alpha centauri today with our existing technology you could have like a um you could have a like steward population that's going to get there and pop the cork but the the colonists could all be embryos that are fertilized here earthlings yeah they are like the earth uh, conceived yeah yeah Wow. Or, or you could go, now we don't have this technology, but to, to kind of borrow two different things. Um, did, did you, I don't suppose you saw Mother on Netflix. Oh, wait, uh, Netflix. it sounds familiar. No. I thought there was a, wasn't a Jennifer Lawrence movie, Mother? It's like a, it's like a, like a horror film. Yeah, I, did, I know which, I, I okay, didn't see not that. One. that. Oh, no, there's, there's one, on, I think it's I Am Mother, I think, where uh-huh. I'm Mother. So it came up last year, but the, okay. the, the premise to this Netflix special was right. really fun, um, is that humanity has been wiped out. Oh, that's always a good story. Yeah, it's always, point. there's a lot of, <laughs> Most most long term colony spaceship type things involve humanity getting wiped. Yeah. There's not a lot of space quakers yes. uh, in these stories. Um, humanity's been wiped out. However, there is a like fail safe bunker for what it, we don't know what wiped out humanity at the beginning of the story. Presumably war of some sort, you know. But in any event, mankind um, apparently built this bunker um, that is has like a thousand frozen embryos in it, and it's got a robot. That's on guard oh, and like basically like a, a, a wires tripped and the robots like, Oh, humanity's dead time for me to come on. And like, it's got, it actually has like a, a warming panel on its shoulders so that it can warm up the baby. Yeah. And uh, it thaws out one of these zygotes and raises the kid in this bunker. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's purpose is to, and I'll, I'll, I'll spoil this. So on the show, everything's fair game. Anything's always spoilers. What you come to realize is that, all of the like, there, there are evil robots outside that are killing all of humanity. Okay. There's the good robot in the bunker that loves its daughter, and you realize later they're all the same robot. There's only one robot. Oh, the robots boy. killed everybody, and basically the robot is like, "No, I'm very pro humanity. I have pruned humanity. I pruned all the bad parts of humanity, and now I'm going to pick the right embryo, and we'll restart." The Genesis yep. story here, and, and the like, yeah, yeah, and the, the 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 daughter of this robot who uh, mm-hmm. is the only hum- the only human in the bunker initially comes to realize that she's not the first attempt. Like she opens up the furnace and finds like teeth and things and realizes that there have been previous daughters that didn't really hit the mark. Um, and uh, with that knowledge, does she, uh, you know, uh, take on the robot mother parent? Yeah. yeah and, well, actually the, succeed. The, 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 the plot art is that like she, from her vent, she's like, let's say 15 in the yeah. film. By the time the, the film, the film hits its main stage. She's old enough to, sh- to, to, to shoot a bow and arrow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> she, she's bow and arrow age uh, as, 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 as is fitting in a sci-fi dystopian uh, future. She, she, um, uh, she thinks that she's the only human on the planet and that uh, outside of the bunker, there is a pathogen which has killed all humans. She believes that the disease has killed all humans and that she's living with her mom, the robot. And then a human who's like very dirty and nasty turns up at the door and is like, please, please, please let me in. And she lets her in and realizes that the robot's been lying to her. There are other humans. They're in a bad – whatever wherever they are, it's not good. Right. Uh, and then – realizes later that she's not the first attempt and then um, basically the the piece ends with the robot mother being like hey think you're doing great good luck and like just recedes into the distance and now it's she's the one human at this warehouse full of embryos and you get the impression that she's like okay let's do this and like she's now the the mother of all mankind um but but anyway and our our forthcoming um uh spaceship rob that's right you, you could have the like spaceship trailer equivalent 
full of zygotes right. that are all frozen that we are going to use to thaw out. And, 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 and if that's the case, you have plenty of genetic diversity. You don't have to worry about that moving forward. Yeah. And one thing we also skip over, we can, we can discuss it briefly. It's not something I would like to include in this story. Uh, but it's this like hibernation chamber model, right? It's like, oh, yeah. we can just sh- send the ship on its merry way. People will be asleep right. and existing for a thousand years. Then they'll wake up. This is the, what is that movie with uh, Jennifer Lawrence and that gentleman? And he wakes up mid, 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 mid ship. Oh, I, uh, I, and then he wakes her up. And it's basically he's committed her. He sentenced her to death by doing this. It's a love story, but it's a very bizarre one. Oh, I haven't seen that one. I know it's, what you're uh, Well, I'm terrible. Well, there's also Planet of the Apes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Planet of the Apes. They're in hibernation, well, and right? Like, and they, all the aliens they, series has that too like everyone yeah. is like in hyper it's a very common uh, very yeah. common tool in science fiction is the idea that you can you can pop somebody in the human freezer and then yeah. pop them out and that, that, that's cheating right yeah like, but that's how we get around well, got, they, things they, in they, science they've fiction. got that in interstellar right yeah, in interstellar yeah. they can do that in planet of the apes they do it and the spoiler turns out they're not actually at a planet of the apes right. they're just at earth of the future so um i, but, I don't i'm not going to use that, that technique but that anymore. would be i'd say like if that were an available technology right. i would think that that would probably be the best one because then you don't have to worry about any of the sociological ramifications right oh, yeah if you've got this, like, if we're going to Alpha Centauri, let me. I'm going to look this up, and I'll uh, I'll, I'll cut down the editing time. That's cool, so that cool, it, cool. But let, let's let's figure out with existing technology how long it would take to get. Oh, down it's a long way, man. It's like um, I want to say thousands of light years, or is it only ninety light years, which is still a long way. Which, yeah, if you if you're using a Buick. Uh, you know, if, if you're going like, uh, uh, you know, uh, however, whatever fast is. So let me. I'm looking at Project Longshot uh, here on. <laughs> On uh, on Wikipedia, Project Longshot was a conceptual interstellar spacecraft designed. It would have been an unmanned probe intended to fly towards Alpha Centauri. Well, that's not helped to that's us. That's not helpful. We, we, we want to man that we, puppy. We, yeah, we, we, we want to put frozen space babies <laughs> right. on there that our robot can thaw out and start building. Um, but according to this, if we were to go the, – the journey to Alpha Centauri B would take about 100 years at an average velocity of approximately – uh, 13,411 kilometers per second. Can about, we go that fast? Uh, uh, maybe. I don't know. It says about 4.5 the speed of light. That sounds right we to me. Do, we we not? We Is that too high? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand. We can't go to the speed of light yet. So no, no, no. Like, but like at 4.5% the speed oh, of light. Oh, percent. I thought you said yeah. times. I was like, what? It's like what? Mach, whatever. What is light speed? Oh, yes. Mach, we definitely can't go four times the speed of light. <laughs> like, that would be, yeah. No, no, no. I, I'm aware of that. Sorry. Uh, so, Warp speed. So about a, about 100 years. Okay, now. That's, th- not, that's actually interesting. Yeah. So, what? 100 years? That's it? According to according to the Wikipedia article, I looked up out of context without knowing the confines or authorship. Hundred years that almost makes the story irrelevant because it's not that. It's only like a couple generations, man. With some good doctors on board, you could probably make it. I you, mean, you know, you could definitely. Like I gotta say, the economist in me comes out here because I like I I thought about this too. How much food would you need to do this? You need like oh. um. So I, I looked up NASA statistics. Oh. A four person crew doing a three year mission would require twenty four thousand pounds of food. And that's, is that – That's uh, for four people. See, but they're assuming that you need all that packaged for the trip. If you have a population of people going – I'm talking like a massive ship, like a battleship, not even – like an, 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 an aircraft carrier right, right. style thing. With, with like arboretums in it. Yeah. Like so you'd be growing yeah. – yeah, I think, I think you'd, have you'd have to do that. I don't think there'd be any way yeah, to do it otherwise. Agreed. Yeah. So it's not going to be like uh, they're eating their K rations every day. Right. So – Which also probably would come back. <laughs> if, if it was just eating K rations. The- I freeze-dried ice cream, uh, yeah. which I always uh, continue to love as an adult. Which – Still, I I, uh, I recently interviewed an astronaut. He's like, we don't eat that. And I was like, good to know. That is, that is just a scam. Just crush my perpetrated soul. Perpetrated on us by yeah. uh, uh, by planetarium gift shops that there's astronaut ice cream. Yeah. So, okay. So, if it were going to be Alpha Centauri then, 100 years. So, basically three generations, right? That's a little – it's actually – I can wrap my head around that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is fascinating. Of course, we're also assuming that Alpha Centauri B is hospitable, right? Because like now if, if it's not – Oh, okay. Here's your story, Rob. No. Here's your story. Okay. It's three generations, right? Yes. They get to Alpha Centauri. It is absolutely inhospitable. And they're like, you know, it's a self-sustaining ship. We just have to go Keep another going. couple thousand years. Like, that's the next bet. Ah, uh, too bad that didn't work out. Yeah. And then you're, then the gen- you've now got the grandkids arriving at Alpha Centauri that are like, what do we do? Because the plan has now gone to hell. We thought there were going to be trees. And it turns out there's just – it's all radioactive landscape. There was Somebody got here and blew it up. You've landed on a real critical question. And as a creator, 
of uh, sort of mediocre content over the years, <laughs> except for Cap South. That was that was like a, st- a diamond Damn in the rough. Right. <laughs> um, I, I, as, as someone who thinks about these things and does write and produce and try to you know somehow get these ideas into uh, uh, into a consumable form, I always like to think about how is the story going to end. Right. What is the what is what what happens when this ship arrives? And so you, you suggested one possible ending, which is they arrive and they lo and behold, uh, the Garden of Eden is not. It's like you know it's terrible. We can't live there. So then what? So that's that's a kind of sad ending, unless it propels them to go to the next mission or something. Or maybe maybe like psychologically. I mean, I don't think this would be the case. But is it possible? Could you have a society that would be everybody in it would be agoraphobic? Is it possible that if you had <laughs> If if you had um, uh, been on a spaceship for three generations mm-hmm. and you get to a planet and they're like, where's the roof? I don't want to live on a thing without a roof. That's crazy. Well, even something you mentioned earlier, like oh, we're talking about the genetic uh, diversity and, and mice and the sort of 2,000-year embryonic uh, fr- you know, frozen ability or whatever, whatever that was. It caught me thinking. I was just – you're talking and I'm in the back of my mind going, pay attention to Andrew. He's saying important things. And then my mind's going this other direction and saying like, whoa, would there be mice on the ship? Would we want to have other right. creatures? Otherwise, the human's relationship, especially several generations in, is – it's it's all based on what you – let's say you have a DVD. <laughs> right. have DVD players on this ship <laughs> or, or whatever. We've got laser discs. We've laser- we <laughs> all got laser discs. But you, you, like you'll see a scene in a movie where a, 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 a human being sees a mouse in the kitchen and jumps back in fear. Yeah. Because yeah. I've been surprised. What is this creature? I've never seen it. I've never actually witnessed it. Is it a, it's kind of like, you know, I wonder, I, I, I'm, I'm going to throw it out. I'm going to go out on a limb. I think, so let, let's assume that we've got uh, on, on the, on the HMS, I'm going to call it the Pinafore, right? Let's go the, with the, that. The, the, the yeah. USS Pinafore. Right. That we're, we're firing that to Alpha Centauri. If I'm, if I'm the one that's outlining this expedition, I'm going to have a minimum of 500 people on it. Okay. For a vi- or, or alternately, Let's say a hundred people and a ton of frozen embryos. Which you, which you personally select an interview. Yeah, before the- I talk to everybody. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, but at least get their pictures, right? Yeah, and yeah, not yeah, like yeah. their uh, Tinder. No thing. fugly like, people. You want like I want a picture of you holding today's newspaper, nothing from six years ago. Um, but you, you've you've got all these people uh, that, that are that are going there. I think if you've got more than a hundred people, you're going to have mice. I don't think there's anything you can do about Someone's it. Someone's going to sneak one on. Like, I think they'll just get on. Think about all the food you're going to bring on. Think about all the agricultural products that's going to come in there. Yeah, you're I probably think- going to have ro- – you might be able to spray for roaches. I think- are there mice on aircraft carriers, for instance? There must be. Oh, I'm right? sure there are. Yeah. And we also have crows on every continent. Crows live on – we didn't bring crows to Antarctica. The crows live in Antarctica. They somehow followed us over I just there. think we could – I think we could We could probably do this in a way that mice wouldn't exist. You think? Okay. We use but, but I'm just an interesting question, right? Yeah. Do you want – Dogs. People. Yes. It's, 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 I am not getting on a friggin' <laughs> spaceship where there's not – I, I thought about this too, Rob. All right. I wrote down, look, this, this is page three, stuff to bring. Dogs. Four dogs. Yes. Cows for cheese. Yes. I'm not. I'm not founding a planet without dogs or cows. I'm not going to a planet that doesn't have dogs. I'm not going to a planet that doesn't have cows. It really raises a lot of uh, interesting, you know, questions about what would bring someone happiness on this journey. Again, the initial first mover knows what they're leaving behind because presumably they left as an adult of their own volition uh-huh. and, you know, they grew up and they had lucky charms or whatever and they're not going to have that anymore. They understand that that they're sacrificing that for the better good of humanity, whatever it is that's motivating them to go. But three or four generations in, what do you – I just don't know what that society is going to – going to look like. Maybe you could have another thing too. What if, what if um, it's voluntary but you either get to go to prison – or you get to go to a prison colony, oh, and, and and the, the idea is like we're colony gonna, all the way. We're, we're right? gonna yeah, but they're, they're like basically we're gonna send like I don't know five hundred guys. No one's get no one's having kids, and you guys, it's your job to go there and like you can do whatever you. All we want to do is have a beachhead when we land a hundred years later. You're all dead by the time we get there, but we just want you to have built a fort yeah. that we can park my space zygotes in yeah. or whatever. And then, and then you've got like a whole other dynamic, right? Cause it's like, you get to be completely free. You just can't come back to earth. Uh, you got to go That's there and do that. The, the prison aspect of this is fascinating. What about like, again, if this first population is friendly and maybe even familiar with one another and, and all in it, for the right reason, how many generations in, and maybe even that's the first movers eventually, some of them might you know, get evil thoughts and want to hurt or harm others. Sure. How do you manage violence and aggression in yeah. that type of society? And even um, 
Yeah, just it's just like fascinating questions. You, you, you're familiar with Dunbar's number? I don't know any of this stuff you're talking oh, about. Okay. Today. This is you know, people <laughs> work pe- on my sci-fi people that is, you know, well, this isn't sci-fi. Oh no, this is a more. I'll, I'll, I'll like say a, anybody that I'm that, so in, anybody that follows me has probably heard me talk about Dunbar's number six times now. So I, but it, you know what? It's important. Right. I'm not even going to apologize. Dunbar's number is uh, a fascinating thing that I think is directly relevant to our spaceship experiment. All right. In that uh, Dunbar, who's alive right now, his name is Robin Dunbar. He's a British sociologist. I'm uh, sorry, I don't know your sir. Yes, sounds like a very important. Uh, <laughs> Okay. I He's accept, a listener, right? I accept your apology, <laughs> okay. as does, I'm sure, Robin Dunbar. <laughs> okay. um, so, uh, what Dunbar wanted to calculate is he looked at primate brain uh, brain pan sizes, and then from that um, also calculated, or in conjunction with that, calculated the size of a stable social group. So, for example, chimps, I believe, can have 60, I think, chimps in a troop. If it gets above 60 – the social dynamics fray and they will either split or they'll drive off a few people or they'll, they'll enter civil war. But in any event, beyond, let's say 60, um, it's no longer a stable unit of chimps. Um, gorillas is less, let's say 40. If you have 50 gorillas, 10 of them are going to die or 10 of them are going to leave or, or they're going to split into two groups and so on and so forth. The smaller the brain, the smaller the group of them. And so he developed an algorithm of the size of the brain and correlating that with the size of the group it can maintain. And then he looked at the size of human brains and came up with 148. Um, we'll round it up to 150. 150 is – the maximum that's like maximum sustainable Twitter followers, I think, right? Is yeah, that, yeah, pretty much. Well, no, actually, that's, <laughs> that's, pretty, that's as good. Like, I, I would say, I think two hundred or one hundred fifty people is the size. That, it's as big as your group can get before it starts needing name tags. Okay, after <laughs> that, hashtags. And, yeah. Well, no, just kidding. I'm kidding. This is great. Because, because, this is interesting. No, because it, because it's relevant in that, like, um, so like, let's say, like, for our spaceship here, or for the early colony, but particularly for the spaceship where yeah. the, the stakes are very high. Um, I would say 150 people or less, I don't think the form of government's really very important be- unless you've got like a tyrant, right? But like, let's say whether we're going to have like, we're going to be communist or we're going to be socialist or we're going to be a Hayekian liberal democracy. I honestly don't think it matters for 150 people because with 150 people, um, you can you can work out any interpersonal problem directly. You don't have to have an external authority. You can just all sit down and be like, Zeke is supposed to be working on the engines. He's not been doing it. Zeke, knock that off, work on the engines. And Zeke's like, sorry, I'm going to do that, right? You get up to like a thousand people, you can't do that. We can't all go confront Zeke personally. You have to have a system right. that like uh, – We don't all know Zeke. Who's yeah. Zeke? Kill that guy. Throw him out an airlock, right? So like, like so, so Dunbar's number is a thing. I think what would be um, – what you'd have to think about is let's say that we're, we're post-Alpha Centauri. We're now five generations in. Um, one, like how big is the capacity for a growing population? Because presumably we've got a maximum uh, oh, amount yeah. of people that can that can be sustained in terms of both space and resources. Oh, but mommy has twins. Oh, yeah. what do you do? That's like the interesting question yeah. too. Right? Uh, or like the other thing too is that like if you if let's let's say that we can accommodate up to five hundred people because that's the you know the marker we need for genetic. Let's say a thousand people, right? right so we we begin with a five hundred person population. We're planning on getting up to a thousand. Well, we've passed Dunbar's number now. We don't all know each other. It's a small town but we don't know each other like are are there apt to form two nuclei uh like if we get past 150 does it become unsustainable from a social we have like two currencies working on the spaceship you know like in different languages that could emerge or or i I almost wonder if it wouldn't be a better idea Uh, this is the sinister captain in me where i would have like a modular ship and i would plan on the ship splitting I would I would build in a plan for that could be the eventually there's going to be three, yeah right? there's gonna, I know some <laughs> dickheads going to come in and be like you know what nuts to you space Quakers we're space space Methodists right. uh, or whatever it is you know you guys the Methodists are, are very angry you're people. space They're Republicans we're space <laughs> Democrats whatever the stupid thing is, and be like okay cool why don't you guys get on the left side of the ship and then <laughs> just blow and it's like great now they're now we're down to Dunbar's number on both sides of it it's sustainable and it, and it goes off and does its own thing. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. Andrew, you've really inspired me. I'm, I have to, have to weave that in potentially. But I think it does – you know, we, we can't – we could talk all day. Unfortunately, the podcast listeners can't endure that. But we but uh, we'll probably won't get in depth on some of the other issues that are fascinating to me. Questions of just like personal fulfillment and happiness in an environment that you're born into versus selecting. Right. right. And I don't know. I don't know the answer to this question. Would – the third or fourth or fifth generation uh, younglings be told that like they have no future. They're not going to make it to the end. Like they're, they only have a certain purpose. By the way, the other thing that's fascinating is like uh, the folks that started on this ship, they had, they had a sufficient number of nuclear engineers and yeah. cooks or whatever the diversity of uh, skills and aptitudes were to populate the ship so it could function. 
at a certain point, you know, people are born and do they choose their profession right. or are they like over time they take some tests. All uh, of us want to be a guitarist. That's right. <laughs> this oh, this other question, week. art, like, and, and, and like emotional fulfillment and, and cinema and, and entertainment are, uh, would there be a sort of um, troop or, or <laughs> this, this also gets in the funny story. Like if I want to tell a story like this, it could be a straight up comedy. It could be like the screenwriters who have to write the one show that everyone watches every week. Like it's the Saturday Night Live. This sounds great. This works out really well for me. <laughs> I'm like, what are, what are your other options? You That's, can't watch Colbert now. Yeah. It's just me. I'm the only I'm the only guy here. Someone well, look, someone has Uncle John's bathroom reader and me. And this really gets at the heart of some of the struggles people face every day. Like I have this creative instinct and this I'm, I'm a, I feel like I'm a funny guy. I'm, I'm Andrew Heaton and I want to be a comedian. But that's not the practical path. That's not what the ship needs, my yeah. son. We need a nuclear engineer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need to go to, you know, study the uh, dynamics of thermal whatever. I don't know what people study at, at nuclear engineering school. But <laughs> yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> By the way, why does it have to be nuclear engineer? Why is it, why is nuclear power so essential to this? I don't know. We could find some other. I, I would also be curious, Rob. Now that you you bring it up, like yeah. I wonder if there is a, um, you know, everybody clearly is going to be literate in this thing, right? There's going to oh. be computers, so we 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 do have a repository and presumably a very wide repository of data and information. Um, but nonetheless, though, is there a is there a threshold of specialists necessary in in order to understand and be able to apply the information and yeah what, if, what if accidents happen yeah what if like the chief engineer falls on the stairs right. and breaks his and it's neck like, well now like- i've got this manual but it's gonna take me a bit of time to yeah. figure out how to how to make a flux capacitor work or whatever we're, we're using and depending on how long the journey is this this year this hundred year journey that's fascinating because that is a like i can wrap my head around that time frame i can imagine uh 1920 and versus 2020 i can't imagine the year 400, right? I still know that's how humanity's evolved over that time. So for me to imagine a spaceship that starts uh, in 2030 and takes off and it's going to get there at the year 7,000, I, mean, I, I can't even just fathom how yeah. that story unfolds. So anyway, but, but, but this, the story, you're, you're, the question you're getting to is, oh, like tech, technological changes as well. Look, we're constantly innovating and, and, and trying new things and new technologies are emerging here, trial and, f- and error and et cetera. We have a smaller population in this confined ship. Presumably, you'd have less opportunity. There'd be fewer brains, right? Fewer individuals tinkering and experimenting and finding new ways to do things. So I'll just give you give it away. It's like a, a, a cheesy ending. Can I talk about what's the ending of the story? I imagine the ship that takes off and it's like it's a thousand year journey and they're they're getting ready to arrive. And when they arrive, it's already populated and it's really like completely uh, – they've been awaiting their arrival. They've read the history records that this ship left thousands of years ago. And then when it was like this question, are they actually going to make it or not? Uh-huh. And it was sort of a lot of uh, – the idea being that even as this ship was initially launched thousands right. of years ago – Science and technology right. progresses on Earth. They develop faster, more efficient ways of travel. <laughs> yeah, no, which <laughs> makes like, a ton of sense. Phew, at some point, like this, phew, the ship goes. Right. What was that? Oh, someone just passed us by, and like this was in the fifth, the third generation. Yeah. Legend has it that we Cause, were cause, passed by a comet, and yeah, 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 yeah. Like, <laughs> well, because because we're using like uh, traditional rockets yeah, today, yeah, and, right. and so f- uh, if it's going to be a thousand years, maybe five hundred years from now, we develop hyperdrive. Hi- or something. You go through like black holes, and you just like warp there, and you can be there in an instant, right? So this is all fascinating stuff, man. And in humans, we've we've dealt with this in our own planet in some way. Like think about travel. Uh, not that long ago to get from, you know, New York to, to France or, or England or something. You're talking like months in the right. ocean. It took, it took, I think, five months to get from London to Virginia Is that- for, for, uh, for, uh, five? Plymouth Rock for the Puritans. Yeah. Five months. Uh, and like, it doesn't sound like a lot of fun, by the way. If you read the accounts of that, because oh. um, when, when I was good, when I was actually, when I was looking up how much, um, food you need, I was on a, a NASA's website and they were kind of talking about like, um, the, the Puritans when they came over to like, basically they had no refrigeration. And they had uh, all you could eat was basically salted like salted meats or something. Yeah, uh, like salted meats, um, hardtack bread, and um, certain kinds of cheeses. But be, like, I'm not imagining very tasty cheeses. A lot of fish. I hope they would catch fish on the Presumably, way. Presumably, <laughs> but it it doesn't sound like like. And I hope they. I hope somebody brought a deck of cards. Oh I don't know. I, don't, I guess they do a lot of singalongs. I don't know, but I don't, Puritans don't strike me as a singalongy group. It doesn't strike me as like a good tub thumping group of people to hang out with. Not a science fiction movie, but an interesting series. It was uh, the uh, John Adams series on HBO. Yeah. Yeah. Which depicts his uh, some of his sea travel, and it's not. Uh, yeah, it doesn't sound. You don't want to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like 
like a leading uh, an ambassador or leader of, a, of our country and he's like in a hammock he's in like the uh, you know first class seating and he's you know throwing up all over himself it's just a nasty environment right. so yeah but imagine that relative to what we have today and like the, the ease of travel it is time shift you went if you went back to that time hey hey mr adams president adams like when i go to france let's go say hi to our buddies over in uh Paris. you know like we're gonna get there in what six seven hours yeah, yeah. Wait, that is time travel to them right? right well you think about like so at the time george washington was alive it took the it took the same amount of time in 1776 to get a letter from london to rome as it took when jesus was alive there was no that, that was the, the a, a a a communique from london to jerusalem took the same amount of time for thousands of years and now like oh, I can okay. tweet a dick pic or whatever I'm doing to like, like you, you think about like, and think about what we use it for, like the acidite <laughs> stuff that we do of like, oh, That's cool. So there's a, there's a dog that, oh, he's got a dynamite or he, he's, he's got a Roman candle instead of a stick. I'm going to, this is what I'm going to do with my time. I'm going to send that to my buddy in Rome. It's like, you know, I heard this and again, it's a little bit cliche, but you hear this saying, it's like, uh, you know, there's more, there's more technology in your smartphone than the, yeah. what they have in the Apollo right. missions. And I'm like, that's why all of us are like taking pictures of our dogs and right. sharing with yeah, families yeah, yeah, versus yeah. like doing really important things. Yeah. So yeah, that's a funny, uh, funny, it's, it's uh, you, you, you read other, like uh, one of my favorite books by uh, Robert Heinlein is Friday and and he's he's writing Friday, I think in like, I think it's in the early '80s. It might be earlier than that, but the character has access to like a computer library, and like she can like go into this like she has a terminal that she can sit down at, and she can just pull up any book she wants in the world, and she spends months just reading books, isn't this? And I'm like, oh man, you misinterpreted what what the because he's basically describing the internet, right, which right. He, he thought that the at least in this book he thought the internet would be like. All of us would just constantly be reading like about Pericles on Wikipedia. Basically, he thought the the internet would only be Wikipedia, and it would it be a source of our it would be a source of, yes, it would, like, be, it would be a springboard to wonder. Right, that would be it. As opposed to now, where like I'm actually far stupider because now I'm like I don't know how to fix a door jam. Google, how do I fix a door jam? And then like you know, it's oh, I call a guy. Like we're actually a bunch of dumber. There's and I'll say to go back to our spaceship thing. Yeah. There, there's ample evidence that there is. Um, at least for pre-literate societies or even with literate societies, there is a maximum or a minimum size necessary to transmit knowledge. So, for example, in um, Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond, he yes. talks about how uh, Tasmania um, – I mean, they had to get there by boat because it's an island, right? But, like, the population was too small for anybody to be a specialist in boat making. So, by the time the Europeans arrived, like, all they – if they needed to get off the island to, like, you know, get, get uh, uh, seagull eggs from a rock or something, they'd kind of hollow out a log – and it would float long enough to get back, and then it would just sink. And that was like that. There, there would be knowledges that that are lost yeah. because you need to have a big enough society to have specialists. And right now, we are a hyper specialized society, yeah, increasingly so, and it's really terrifying. This is the other story, which we're not going to talk about at length, but I think I've mentioned to you. It's my other like, if I was warped back into t- uh, back into the past, yeah. say several thousand years, and. Uh, I'm going to be put to death because I look weird and I don't I speak funny and I mean, that sort I, of thing, right? Both I'm of us sure. at any given time, even here in 2019, <laughs> Rob, it's amazing. Any given moment, we're crowds here. haven't killed us with a pitchfork. Um, but then they say, well, we'll give you 24 hours if, you know, <laughs> of course, that's how they're going to talk, right? Yeah. Well, Mr. Rafferty, yeah, yeah, nothing yeah. like this. Again, Listen, witch, <laughs> you have 24 hours to prove you're not a witch or at least a useful one. And so I'd be like, well, you know, the future, I'm from the future. Trust me, okay? Yeah. It's an amazing place. There are these things. We can send dick pics to London (laughs) instantaneously. You guys have to get parchment and like draw it. You're not very good at drawing yet. Well, what would you do? What would you say to someone in that time to demonstrate, to prove like, and you could have access to things, but I don't, I don't know, for instance. How to like what? What is, oh, yeah, what is the I'm substance useless. of a match? I don't know what an arm. I think arm, a match, like instant fire, would yeah. amaze people. Yeah, I don't yeah. even know how to do that. I could like, scrape sticks together. Sulfur. Real fast. I don't know. It's like, there are there are microbes. You guys should be washing your hands. Yeah. What are you talking about? I see. I I, I think because you've asked me this before, it's a great question. Yeah. And, I, and I've got by the way, I've got a list of party questions, and this is this has entered my my. Have uh, you got any good answers to this? Because I, I just don't. Yeah, know no. Engineers is. are good to talk to. Okay, like engineers, I found, and, oh, and build a bridge or show them yeah, something. They're they're like and they like in engineers because I'm like I'm not an engineer. I'm dead. I'm yeah. I'm I'm arts and science is trash. I don't have anything useful. Like, hey, do you need a joker? I've got jokes from the 21st century. I have all these Yakov Smirnov jokes I can tell you. Um, yeah, no, I'm dead. Um, there is, I will say there, there is a, uh, a, I can't remember what it's called on the internet, but a guy has like a 
a diagram called So You've Gone Back in Time. Oh, wow. And it's it's a one-page PDF print-off that you can download that has, like, this is how microbes work. This is how to make uh, – I, I don't remember. The, 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 like, he goes through, like, this is this is how to make um, uh, antibacterial medication, right? I, Penicillin. I, I, um, and he has all these I, – I think I'm screwed, so I would be like this. Look, we all know you're going to kill me, all right? Because you're a bunch of mouth-breathing savages <laughs> that think that, like, you need to build up stink to protect yourself from witches, sure. whatever nonsense you – Friggin' heathens. I don't know why I'm so angry at this group of people <laughs> I'm presumably, is very pre- presumably descended from. Yeah. Uh, but I would go like, we all know you're to kill me. So just, just try this, okay? Next time you give a woman's giving birth, everybody involved, have them wash their hands beforehand. <laughs> I think you're going to find less people die. Thank you. I will now have my head cut off, okay. you savages. Like, I think that's what I would do. I don't, the other I'd be killed. Anyway, it would be funny, too, if they killed me and they're like, that guy was a dick. We were going to make him king. Yeah. Uh, but he kept, uh, yeah. Which, by the way, leads me to another scenario. I thought about this. Oh. On, on my space Ship. I'm sorry. Back to spaceships. I'm yeah, really sorry. I took us down the no, road. No, no, you're okay. Yeah, uh, right. On my spaceship, have to be dogs, have to be cows. I was thinking two funny scenarios. Um, th- this is this is the we're, sitcom. If we're going spaceship. the yeah, if we're going the sitcom okay. spaceship route, um, one have a sitcom or have a have a spaceship. Well, the the, the easier one. I won't elaborate on this one as much. Uh, it's just me and. Everybody else is a woman or a eunuch or gay. This sounds like fr- – this isn't even funny. This is just kind That's of awesome. fascinating. I yes. think this would be pretty – I'd have lots of friends and things, but no one's reproducing outside of Heaton. That which, by the way, of, terrible uh, idea for long-term genetic viability. That reminds me of the Monty Python Sir Robin scenario where he's you know taken to the uh, – He's rescued. Did you ever see uh, – come on. Yeah, Monty Python. Yeah, but what's Monty that, what's that Holy movie? Grail. Holy Grail. Yeah, of course. He gets to the castle and it's all women. Yeah. yeah, yeah they're yeah. going to torture him in sort of interesting ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want a little bit more of the torture. Yeah, well, I think, I'm thinking like this is um, – in, the, the in, in this scenario where Andrew Heaton becomes the progenitor of a new species, um, great – Great trip. Yeah. Like, I enjoy this, but probably not great for genetic diversity. Yeah. Although it has happened before. Did you know this? I we, don't know this. So, we, we've got um, – there are – there is uh, through through genetic uh, genetic analysis, we can now determine that there there is oh, a, yeah, an I've ancestral Eve. There is an ancestral Adam. Yeah. Um, and, and to clarify, I uh, – while uh, I am using religious terminology and saying an Adam and Eve, I am not – I am not inferring that – the Bible, the, the the literal story of Genesis has been proven. Rather, um, we know that at some point there was a bottleneck in in human populations. We think a few times, and at one point there were um, few enough human beings that only one woman from that particular period still has viable offspring today. So there might have been like let's say a thousand women that were alive two hundred thousand years ago. We were very because at one point we were probably an endangered population um, and we were you know go humans we've done a great comeback uh, and take that giraffes I'm going to try to sound smart for a second but it's all a front uh, only because uh, my wife told me about a book it's called Sapiens yeah 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 by uh, uh, yeah yeah uh, anyway that's what you that, that's what you're telling me good, good job me of, okay <laughs> Every, everyone should read that book <laughs> it's all it's going to prove whatever whatever he's talking Rob, about Rob's contribution is uh, <laughs> hold on I'm going to sound smart my wife my wife read a book <laughs> that sounds pertinent to what you're talking about go on go on so uh anyway i, I buy what you're saying i also think that you talk about like one person propagating like just tons of people isn't it that like that isn't it the attila the hun is that the guy yeah. who's just like attila. all over so many so, so i'm gonna make an, i'm making this up this is where science meets my imagination but it's something like i read a stat somewhere i don't want to you know, propagate mistruth, but it's something like ten percent of the mm. Asian population. Yeah, has, Genghis Khan. Yeah, is that a Genghis Khan? What did I say? Yeah. Tell the Hun. Well, but who yeah. the hell is that? I think they're not different. They're different people. Yeah, they're different. Aren't they? Yeah, they're sorry, different Genghis and Attila. Well, but, but uh, my guess is I I, I don't I don't Wait know as much about Attila. Attila probably had a few bastard kids. I would guess Genghis and Attila uh, and, and Charlemagne were they in, in about the same time frame? Do I know? don't know the dates on Attila. I'm gonna do some research. I feel like Attila this. is what he's like. He's late Roman Empire, whereas Genghis Khan, I don't know. What I do not know anything about these um, guys. Just, well, oh, so, so to back up, because I, I find this stuff fascinating. We, we do have a um, – there's a mitochondrial Eve and a chromosomal Adam. Um, so basically, we can um, – your your chromosomes are – or your Y chromosome, rather, is passed always through the male, right? Because yes. it's a Y chromosome. Your, your mother could not give you a Y chromosome. Um, so we can trace a, a chromosome through a male lineage all the way back. Okay. Um, whereas mitochondria comes from the mom. So like you're, you're, all of us are really about 51% our mom, 49% our dad, because that little bit extra is coming from the mitochondrial from the mother. So mitochondria is always traced through the, the female line. Wow. Um, we can go back and it, basically there's a rate of mutation that we can more or less pinpoint that for every gener- every few generations, X amount of haploid deviation occurs. And by looking at the rate of, uh, of mutation over time at form or like 
really old fossils we find, really old uh, tissue samples, we can go back and go, oh, about 200,000 years ago, uh, literally everybody's now descended from one woman. Uh, because we can look at these various strains of mitochondria and go, yeah, there was one, one woman, everybody's descended from her. And later on, there's one guy, everybody's descended from them. Not in the sense that there was a guy and a hundred women and everybody in the sense that there were probably a thousand guys and like, you know, Bob's tribe goes off and gets wiped out by a flood and like Tim's tribe, uh, you know, gets eaten by lions and only Bob's tribe survives. But I think that the first woman was probably the owner of that 10,000 year old dog that they just found. Did you hear about this? No. What? They found a 10,000 year old dog in the ice oh, cool. and it's not a wolf. It's a dog. It's clearly domesticated. Oh, I hope they clone it and bring it back. Wouldn't that be awesome? I'm bringing something to this conversation that you don't know. It's <laughs> remarkable. This is the yeah. only time in the story it's going to happen. I'm going to send you the link. Yeah, it's very do. cool. There are scientists and other people just found this. Uh, well, I hope they bring it back. They've also, uh, they've. Oh, yeah. Pull his DNA and like yeah. the old, uh, what's that, Jurassic Park thing yeah, on. That'd be awesome. Yeah. It's cool. It looks, it was clearly, I don't know how they know this, by the way. It looks freaky. It has. You know, it's like Toto with fangs. It was very That's scary. Awesome. Yeah. But uh, they have some evidence to believe it was domesticated. And that means, oh, man's relationship with dogs was like even predates what we initially thought, I guess. I don't know. I, I don't know, Andrew. I read headlines and then I, I lose my – Because well, well, dogs go back at least, what, like 12,000 years? I, think? Just, I have no clue. Like my, my, my theory is I think uh, dogs are more domesticated than cats. Because, like, try taking a cat on a walk. Cats don't want to go on a walk with you. Uh, my well, niece would disagree. She walks her cats. It's very bizarre. Behavior, yeah, but frankly. your dog does. Your dog, <laughs> your dog definitely wants to go on a walk. If you're like, dog, you want to go walk through the woods? It's like, let's do it forever. I don't ever want to go back in the house. Important point, though. Dogs on the ship, maybe cats on the ship, cows for cheese, et cetera. But this is an interesting question. Unless I, you could make dog cheese, which sounds terrible, but it probably would save on resources. We, dis <laughs> we have disagreements over what animals we'd want on there. Uh, I think a lot of people would have a disagreement on that. I think there – and you and I disagree on their ability to be certain that there are no mice or no right. cockroaches or no this or that. We you think they're going to find a way on. Somehow there's yeah. bastards are everywhere, right? I, I think there's probably a Murphy's Law that applies to extermination. But this is not Noah's Ark. You're not going to get everything right. on there. Yeah. So what are you going to leave? leave on? You're not going to have elephants. They're too big. You know, certain things are just impractical. But you still have to let people know on the ship that those things existed. They were real. Or are those people going to think this is all just entertainment and oh, fantasy? It'll be cool. Like, you know. if, if we've got the frozen zygote thing. Oh, shit. Maybe, frozen uh, right. and, zoo and, creatures. And, and, and maybe to like, maybe as like a national ceremony on the new planet every year we thaw out a new species yeah, it's like, like wow we, we it's a surprise take thing out of the bucket and it's like oh hey cool this year giraffe you get to rename it that's fascinating yeah, because yeah. then it would not be a giraffe anymore right it would be a whatever they want to call it yeah. oh, here's one more point sorry and we're, this Go, is too much fun yeah. the evolution of language over time right for instance, terms that the kids use today that have, you know, evade my understanding. That's only like, what, 10 years of difference between some of the hipsters and what the word. And hipsters isn't even a term for that age. I don't even know what I'm talking about at this point. The bottom line is I still, I still try to stay somewhat connected with the lingo and whatnot. But in a hundred years, I'm certain that there'll be things that, you know, Anyway, so I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm a little, I'm a little uh, incoherent here. What I'm saying is on this multi generational ship, how would, could we even communicate? When they get to this, when they get to the final destination, ah, oh, shit. No, no, I think, you, I think I've lost my train. No, you're right. So it's like, like a few things. So like, like um, something that I learned over the summer that I think is interesting is that um, uh, language mutation appears to be a an evolutionary tactic. Right. Um, so you know, you've, you've got the Tower of Babel in the Bible, and the story is that man, hubris and man attempting to rival God, etc. God, you know, knocks Crumbles the human languages thing, apart. Yeah. yeah. Um, but there's a, there's a genetic component to this wow. where. Um, it would, if we if we go back, you know, our species is about three hundred thousand years old, and it would appear that most of it's very bloody. Most oh, of the right. archaeological evidence and anthropological evidence indicates that we were killing each other with sticks constantly, yeah. and now is the most peaceful time in all of human history. Uh, and if we go back to like now, it is more. It is far better for me to in 2019, 2020, depending on when this episode comes out. It is uh, it is more advantageous for me to be able to speak a language with a foreigner so that I can trade with them than it is to spot them instantaneously so I can fight them. Right. It would be very weird if right now somebody spoke Italian and I was like, got to kill them. But it would appear that if we go back 200,000 years ago, the uh, the advantageous nature of that is uh, is flipped where I'm, I'm not trading with you. I'm, I'm a guy with a stick. Uh, you're coming over the hill. I need to know immediately if you're on my tribe or a foreign tribe because we're going to fight each other. Right. And so as a result of that, human language mutates very, very quickly so that we can immediately differentiate ourselves. So that if you and I go off and we form two new tribes, 
within a generation, those tribes can now know, well, he's not from my tribe. I need to fight him. And that's going to keep happening. We have that. And it happens with teenagers. Does it mutate quickly in conditions where it's permitted to mutate versus on the ship where we'd have a dictatorial, yeah. like, right? uh, militant grammarian there making yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. No, no, that's not a word, oh, right? gosh, that person sounds horrible. <laughs> if, like, 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 I get to – you get to be the guitarist. Well, we I still just- kind of have that person. Does, don't – doesn't uh, – what are they, what are they, what's with the dictionary? Webster? Which I don't even know. But like, don't they establish new words every year? They like welcome yeah. new words into the language. Well, like, like selfie was not yeah. a word or something. Well, Fr- France, French is like that because French. Yeah, they're very, French, very French, French uh, got the, they're, there's regulated. A, yeah, there's a group of people called the Hundred Immortals and they are uh, legally so in charge. Be on the ship, right? Huh? Yeah, I'm not. <laughs> first of all, we're not letting French people on the ship. Uh, secondly, uh, we're, we're definitely. Yeah. No, they've got that. Um, there's also a rule of, there's a rule of, uh, a rule of thumb within linguistics, as I understand it, that uh, it takes about a thousand years for a language to become mutually unintelligible unto itself. So if we if we were to go, we're speaking English, or we to go back in time to the year ten twenty, we wouldn't be able to understand anything. And I mean, we don't even have to go back that far. Like if we go back in time to like Shakespeare. I, I'm sure there's people that listen to the podcast that are smarter than I am that can can. I just heard an NPR interview with someone from Scotland, and I couldn't understand yeah. what the hell they were talking <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're from Glasgow. <laughs> no one in, in Scotland can understand them. So I, I believe that. Uh, well, I think Rob, we're, we're going to wrap it up. We're about a, about an hour and ten minutes. We'll do that's this. way too long. And, you know, and we, we we no no it's fine. We and we didn't actually get into this, although I don't know any of this. We would we, you you mentioned in the beginning of the program if we would want to have a 50 50 gender ratio. Oh yeah. Uh, and yeah. I, I don't actually know. Uh, pre- presumably, you'd want to do that for sociological purposes. Purposes because um, my thought would be if you if you were looking to maximize the amount of kids, then it would probably be better to have a female heavy ratio. However, uh, if I'm on that spaceship and they're like Heaton, by the way, you didn't make the cut. Uh, uh, you you don't like that, that guy's going to have more wives. You don't get any. I could see there being problems, right? So we didn't really get into that, but presumably fifty fifty. We also didn't get into uh, would we be looking to. Um, pick specific personality types to go on the spaceship. Yeah. Um, NASA does to some extent, right? They, they want to pick people that aren't going to flip out when they're in space. So would we be picking, I assume, people that are okay with confined spaces and very good with intergroup dynamics – um, more than misanthropes, presumably. You, what's the filtering mechanism, right? Is it an application process? You could look a little bit at some of the, what's happening now with the Mars trips, right? There's, yeah. so there's like a process of filtering. There's so many thousand people that say, I would go to Mars and never come back. Right. right. You probably have a little bit of a, you know, there's something wrong with you in a sense. If you, <laughs> you sign up for that. You're, you're high on adventure. Right? So, low like, on, yeah. And once you're in there for a couple of months, you're probably like, this was a bad idea. There's no going back, but you're going to murder all your, uh, you know, fellow spacemen. And then that's it's just, just. You'd probably be on the lookout for social. Yeah, I would you got, think you'd probably want to you want to limit so, that. So we're gonna have to filter for that somehow. Yeah. That's a that's a good point, uh, Rob. If because you you said before we started that you would welcome feedback on this issue. Yeah, um, and I'm a collaborator by nature. I, I want to do something with this concept and the story, but it's so nebulous. There's so many rabbit holes to go down, and as you can clearly tell, we could talk about it for hours and hours. And uh, if any of your viewers, I'm, scared, I'm sorry, listeners, if any of the podcast listeners are interested in continuing this conversation, please shoot me an email. Rafferty, R-A-F-F-E-T-Y at gmail.com. I'm on Twitter, Rob Rafferty. But yes, anybody out there that is interested and has ideas, thoughts, feedback, I'd love it. Because I'm just at the stage where I want to tell the story. I don't know. There's so many possible ways to tell it. I get I get frustrated and confused. But if folks out there have any ideas, I'd be I'd love to hear them. I will reply to any in each and every email. I will I will send you some response. Uh, so wonderful. And I'll, I'll throw out if people want to talk to other listeners of the show. Uh, 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 Michael Boudreaux set up a Discord channel for us. And so uh, basically, if you're unfamiliar with Discord, Discord is from my – I'm sure this sounds so horrible, but it seems to me to be comparable to an AOL chat room uh, where, where basically there's – you go into this Discord server, Heaton's Heathens, and there's lots of different channels. So there's one for politics. There's one for whiskey. There's one for sci-fi. Uh, and so if you want to hear what other people on the program are thinking about this um, – Email Rob. He's he's clearly uh, keen to hear from you. But if you want to hear what other if if we were all going to get together and design a a multi generational spaceship for listeners of the show, how are we going to put it together? That would be the message board that you would go to, and I'll put a link in the show notes. Rob, this was a great topic. I like this is. I'm I'm really glad you contacted me and suggested doing this. I think this is a really fun thing to discuss. Thanks for your patience. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. And good luck is a great show. And uh, keep it up. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, buddy. Hello, space pirates and mintats. Heaton here. 
Rob Rafferty, the guest that was on today's show, has, since our interview, started his own podcast. It's called Raff's Brain, and it is about his creative process leading up to the one-man show he's going to be doing this year in Washington. Perhaps about the topic we discussed today. It would explain why he kept alluding to a project, wouldn't it? So check out Raff's Brain for more Rob Rafferty. Meanwhile, on this podcast... Thank you for your stellar reviews on Apple and other podcasting platforms. That helps expand the show to the point that new people find it and cool guests want to clamor aboard. Craig writes, Andrew Heaton is delightful. His deadpan humor and obscure references are as refreshing as a margarita on a beach in Mexico. Thank you, Craig, for the review and the ties you sent me. Which I think I left on Alderaan? I'm going to contact their lost and found department. Either way, thank you. And keep those reviews coming. Now, on to the next installment of Intergalactic Vagabonding. Every week, my friend Nick Spurduti and I do comedy at some interesting place, some interesting world or location, and then we, uh, we come on the, uh, the show and give you a review of it. And this last week, uh, we had a really interesting gig. Um, not not as well paying as usual, but but interesting. We were we were working at an amusement park. Uh, we we were characters at an amusement park. So um, if you've if you've been to the Disney World, say you you know that there are like uh, you know there's like Germantown or Epcot Center or whatever, and there's there's people that play characters there, and they needed some comedians. We were doing that. Nick, Nick do you want to walk them through? Well, basically, we were asked to do a couple sets for guests as they came through, and uh, the equivalent of like working in a cruise ship, basically. Yeah. And uh, so we had a couple of shows there. I'm, well, I'm well, more well, upset. We should say where where it was. Yeah, I was gonna just say I'm more upset, really, that we didn't go to where I wanted to go. Yeah. Well. And we ended up in Westworld. Right. And they gave us the option at the very right. beginning, uh-huh. and I said, please, let's pick Samurai World. That seems uh, so much cooler. God. But then I kind of agreed, because you were doing that Samurai accent. I was doing the I Samurai imagine. impression. I was and really, I, 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 I had this whole Samurai thing that I was going to do, where I, I would, I had a Japanese accent the whole time. Yeah, no, that's, and, that's why and I, I, would, I would bow a lot, and so and, we, and and you, you thought we were going to get in trouble. And and so like that that's sure. on you, buddy. Yeah. I was happy to do either one. It's just yeah. if I was gonna do if I was gonna go to, to Samurai World, I was gonna play a Japanese character. And yeah. then so that I was forcing I was asking you not to do that. You said if I go there I'm doing that. So we were at an at an impasse and I said, Fine, let's just go to Westworld, which you were yeah. also happy to do. I was I would rather go to Westworld anyway. Yeah, I would I, I was like like I, so I get to be a cowboy? I get to be yeah. a cowboy or a samurai. I would rather be a cowboy than a samurai. So we did some Westworld gigs. Yeah, we did some. So we were at the uh, the local uh, board. I think bordello. They were calling it a whorehouse, but it was a, it was a bordello. A tavern, sort of. Yeah, yeah, it was like it was like a saloon. And basically, um, f- the the conceit of this place. If you haven't been to Westworld, uh, everybody there's a robot. And so if you're a tourist, you can like shoot people and go on adventures and like go to the whorehouse. But it, I guess, doesn't count as adultery. I'm not really sure. In any event, is this kind well, of I think it probably still does. Does it? They said on the it, brochure it doesn't on the brochure. <laughs> I'm looking at the brochure right here and it says you yeah. can totally have sex at the whorehouse because it's no different than porn. It's not a real person. And then underneath it, it says also feel free to shoot people. They're not real people. They're robots. It's no different than unplugging a washing machine. So it says that they wouldn't put that on the brochure unless that were true. That's true. I guess yeah. if they put that on the machine, then fine. Yeah, they put that on the brochure. On the brochure part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, so we were basically the, the long and the short of it is, from what I can tell, they're they're not very good at programming robots to be funny, and so they needed comedians uh, to do that. So we were kind of doing like kind of an old timey vaudeville routine type thing. Yeah. So we, yeah, it was we were fun. At, we were at the bordello. Yeah, it was cool. There was a you know there's like a there's like the the guy in the bowler hat with a handlebar mustache playing the piano, uh, and there's the <laughs> the, uh, the 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 lady in the corset over at the bar, you know, and and uh, and, and then we there was. A little bit like kind of a stage in the back room and we would we would do some sets and that kind of thing yeah i was cool with it but they just like they always had a robber come in in the middle of the sets right and they just started it was <sighs> worse than a check drop so like like in comedy terms that we, we have the term check drop yeah and you, you don't want to get that if you're doing stand-up the check drop is the end of the evening when everybody's got to pay for their bill so everybody's so distracted 
Yeah. Right, they're not paying attention. They're probably a little irritated because comedies tend to, comedy clubs tend to overcharge for drinks. That's how they make Ugh. their money. They don't they don't really make the money off admission. They make the money off of the food and drinks. And so, you know, you were thinking you were probably going to pay twenty bucks. You're now paying like forty to fifty bucks, and yep. you're working that out. You're working out the tip. And I we're trying to do so. A bank robbery, I would say, is is worse than that in terms of distracting people. Uh, certainly, and uh, also they always tried to shoot us. Yeah, as kind of like as kind of like, hey, like if you guys don't give us all the money here, we'll kill the comedians. And yeah. of course, the guests think that we're robots, right? Because we're part of the entertainment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They did not remotely care. They were like, "Do it, shoot him. We want to see him. We want to see him." We got die. shot at, by the way, by several guests, and I kept getting clipped. Yeah, and uh, killed, and and um, well, <laughs> not uh, <clears throat> not okay. killed. Yeah, yeah, but, okay. Um, no, see that? Okay, that I'm still kind of, I'm very confused shit. by that whole thing. I'm very yeah. confused by that whole thing. So, in my case, they would shoot at me, and it was like, it was basically like a paintball, right? Like, it had hit me, and I could feel it, like, you know, like dust would, like, push off of my, off of my super cool leather jacket. Uh, but but it, it didn't hurt really. I mean it, it was it was it hurt no more than a paintball, right? Um, and so it was fine. Um, and and then like I'd laugh, they'd laugh, I'd point and go human, and then they'd go, oh you're a human, that's awesome. You would just be laid out cold, like you would get shot, fall over, and really appear to be dead. And then I would kind of freak out because I thought you were dead. And and it's then it's called commitment, Heaton. It's all about commitment in comedy. You gotta just go with that sort of stuff, you know. You act like you're getting shot, uh, ah, ooh, you know, and then you're down for the count, and then you let the people from the uh, resort come in and fix you up as if you're a robot or whatever. Yeah, these guys, these guys in white, like creepy white suits, like like full body hazmat suits, would come in and, and haul you out on a stretcher. And 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 then the I would go the like, show. yeah, hey, what are you doing with my friend? And then they would just roll their eyes and say it's a washing machine. And I'm like, no, it's a comedian. And then and then you you would leave. But then you, the following morning, you'd be fine. Yeah. You know, you just got to play it out till the end. You know, it's all about commitment. OK, that checks out. That sounds legit. Um, commitment. I'll say real quick. It was it was very boring because when you would appear to be shot and appear to be dead for a long period of time and then be wheeled out by those guys along with all the other robots, um, they turned all the robots off at night. So it's just me. It's just me and a bunch of mannequins. And I, I thank God I brought a book, uh, Tunnel in the Sky you by Robert Heinlein. supposed to go back to the hotel. Oh, okay. Well, I was just hanging out in the saloon. I just figured, I didn't think anybody was going to be at the hotel. I, I guess there would have been more humans there. I should have done that. Guests. Uh, but the guests were there. So can I, okay. Another thing that confused me, Nick, is mm -hmm. we met this nice blonde lady, like nice farmer lady. Her name was Dolores. Very nice. And, uh, and real sweet. I liked her, you know, uh, robot, of course. Um, yeah. But she kept like trying to recruit you into some kind of robot uprising. Okay. Not, okay. not me, which was frankly kind of rude because like I would have helped and, and stuff. But she would like turn to me and be like, you're a human. You're going to die in the bloodbath that ensues. These, what was it? These passions will i don't know there's some phrase she had but like clearly didn't like me for no discernible reason but in your case she would kept saying kept, kept saying that you're a cylon and that as a result you're you're a robot brethren and should join the revolt and i was like no he's not he's not a cylon he's i think he's catholic he's not yeah i went to his wedding there was a priest and everything he's catholic you know, uh, okay, Heaton, what are we trying to get out of here? You're trying to say I'm a Cylon, trying to say I'm a robot or whatever. Uh, I mean, yes. Oh, yeah, when I, we were on the Replicant Homeworld, they took me back and got rid of human Nick and made me come out, and then I have been living his life with his memories and whatnot. <laughs> Ah, you know, man, and I think that sometimes I'm the better comedian. I, I, I had I had forgotten about that. I remember that now. That actually would explain quite a lot. Is that what happened? It would explain it if I didn't just make it all up right off the top of oh. my head. <laughs> I'm an improviser, baby. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's what I do, you know. Okay. Well, that it's checks my game. out. It's my game. All right. Cool. Here. You so think there's some sort of insurgence where they're just placing Cylons into human society and and creating this other world where we start to slowly make our way to the top and then finally get to take over and control the whole human race? Because that sounds absurd. It does. I agree. I 
I can't believe that I apparently brought it up. Uh, yeah. it, it sounds ridiculous when you say it that way. It sounds Thank ridiculous you. when you say it that way. Uh, let me think. A couple other things. Um, oh, I got to be sheriff. That was cool. You did. Be- that was very cool. Yeah, because ba- basically the deal was we had to do uh, three performances. We did a performance at uh, 10 a.m. at lunch, and then we did a matinee performance at 1, 1 p.m. So we were done by 1 p.m. every day. And, uh, and, and the deal was that we got to uh, hang out in the park um, just as regular guests. We got like a day pass uh, at, at, you know, as of uh, 2 o'clock when our show was over. And so that's, you know, that's, it, it, the park doesn't close down for a while. Um, so I, uh, I, I ran for sheriff, and uh, all of our Wookiees came with us. And so I made them all deputies. I don't know if you've ever seen a Wookiee in a cowboy hat. It is pretty adorable. It's adorable. So it really it was, is. Yeah, yeah. Just, just me and the Wookiees walking around. Genuinely. Yeah, it yeah. was pretty cool. Joe Blobe, uh, where was he? He honestly, I'm pretty sure, never made it off of the on the bus. Yeah, he was just tripping and stuff. He, he was trying to get off of the train on the way there, and I'm pretty sure he kept getting closed in the door. And he was just kind of falling over himself. And I thought he would just, I thought he would show up eventually. And we left. And then he was just waiting for us at the train. I think he might have given up. Yeah, he just had like a little snow globe and some souvenirs and postcards and things. It looks like he hung out at the gift shop for several yeah, days. Yeah, he just probably went to the gift shop. Uh, also, I believe that it was as these uh, violent delights have violent ends. That's what she kept saying. These violent yeah. delights have violent ends. And then she'd give me this super dirty look. And I'm like, what? Like, what did I do to you? Dolores, very smart very capable i'm pretty sure she kind of was more a little hyper aware than the rest that's just what i picked up yeah um, not that i had any inside information because <laughs> why would i yeah but, being um, human there's no way you would know yeah 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 yeah. which yeah for sure so it would that was what was crazy about it you know yeah well it was a it was a fun trip i would go back i would do that again i mean it was kind of same, same, we, same. you know like we weren't I gotta say it wasn't quite the same level of respect we usually get from an audience because they thought we were robots and sometimes they would shoot at our feet to make us dance but uh, that said though it was basically like a free trip to Disney World so even even though we didn't make a lot of money on it like it kind of doubled as a vacation so I, I enjoyed was, that it was fun to just kind of hang out for a little while as well when we weren't working that was nice um, I, I did I mean the food uh, at the hotel super great uh, yeah. Although most of the time you kind of stayed in the park for some reason. Yeah, I just ate beef jerky in the park, drank whiskey yeah. and stuff. Yeah, which is also kind of up your alley. So I'm not like I didn't th- you you didn't seem upset by it. No, I you know I needed to do some thinking, so it was okay. Overall, good trip. Uh, I will give I'm going to give Westworld eight out of ten. You know what? I was thinking the same thing. I'm going to go eight point three. Okay. Uh, I enjoyed uh, some of those shows a lot i think it was a little bit repetitive my only complaint Mm -hmm. but overall very fun i don't regret going to westworld but next time we're going to samurai world oh yes we will go no 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 no, no, no. nope maybe not never mind i decided against it all right man we'll find somewhere else okay until next week that's the show Thank you, Rob Rafferty, for supplying a great episode premise and spectacular guesting skills. Thanks, Taylor Stanridge, for audio engineering. And thank you, Nick Spruduti, for our ongoing intergalactic adventures, whether or not you're truly a Cylon. But you're probably not a Cylon. You're probably human. I think human, right? Until next time, tally-ho! Tally-ho!